We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Yeah, foothills, we mean to worship the God who alone is worthy. He loves you and he calls you to know him. He's the eternal God who exists outside of time and space, and yet he's present with us in this moment. So let's lift our eyes and our hearts as we lift our praise, yeah?
Well, Foothills, it's so good to be with you. My name's Dan. Welcome. If you're in person or watching online, welcome. It's so good to be with you, and it's so good. It's so good. I can't state, overstate that to hear you all sing. <laughs> this last year has been really hard, um, and uh, I've been shown just how important it is for us to be together, reminded, convicted even, that church is as much about an opportunity for us to encourage one another and to be an encouragement as it is to be encouraged ourselves. And to hear you sing is such a great reminder of that. I hope it is for you as well. And just to underscore that even further, we're just going to take a minute before we sing our next song. And I'm going to give us all an opportunity to pray for the people around us and to be prayed for. You may not know the people in front of you. I'd invite you to pray for the people directly in front of you. And if you're in the front row, maybe pray for the people in the back and then we'll all be, we'll all be covered. Um, if you know them, you can pray specifically. If not, there's some general prayers on the screen that I would love to have prayed for me and I hope you would as well. I just don't want us to leave here feeling isolated. It's not good for us to be alone. And when we meet together, we encourage one another and we carry one another with our songs and with our prayers and with our presence together. So we're just going to sit in this moment. You can pray out loud. Please respect people's privacy if you do, or you can pray quietly. But I'm going to give you a moment. Let's pray for each other and then we'll keep lifting our voices together.
between heaven and earth and between each other. And so we can praise unified together. Let's celebrate that. Swing wild, all you have is let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath repeat the sound. All these children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Sweet wine, all you have is. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, we need the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Hey there, everyone. I hope you're having a great day already and it only gets better from here. Starting with this, your announcements. And the first of them, our elder and deacon boards will be reviewing nominations for candidates for the next term starts in September. But we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to nominate a man from our FBC family. You can submit your recommendations online under the events and info tab. And you can do that on our website today. Next thing we've got for you, FSM, the Foothill Student Ministry starting off the summer with a bang. It's gonna be a great summer. It starts incredible, it gets better. And so all students, all your families, you're invited to a fun night of games, food, inflatables, and all kinds of other stuff too. Great way to make new friends and welcome those incoming students to our community. Block party to kick off is gonna be at the shed next Sunday, May 23rd from four o'clock to six o'clock in the evening. We really wanna see you there. Finally, VBS is coming up soon and it's such an incredible experience. You got this full week where kids are learning about Jesus. They're learning about God's word, in really fun and exciting ways. And a lot of these kids give their lives to Jesus at VBS and we are stoked to have it open again. VBS begins June 14th, runs through the 18th, and this year's theme is Rocky Railway. Registration is open to everyone. Space is limited. Be sure to sign up online. I already got my kids signed up. You can also stop by the lobby after the service today. And that is all I've got for you today. I'll see you next week. Hi guys, 
so good to see you, to see your smiling faces. It's very, very good. Um, we do, as you, you may or may not know, we have a section in the back. If you want to wear a mask, totally fine. Wear a mask and you can sit anywhere, but we have a place where only masked people will sit. Otherwise, the whole room is mask optional. And man, it, it, like Dan was saying, it's, it's different, isn't it? Hearing people sing a little better. Like, I could, I could, you could sense it. You're like, man, this is like... This is kind of good. It's kind of awesome. So we're talking about corporate worship today. Um, and here's how we're getting there. If you haven't been with us in this series at all yet, we're, we're basically saying, look, as life is beginning to get back to normal, what, what kind of normal are we going to return to? Are you looking forward to just getting back to what was the former normal for you? We'll call that the, the normal normal. Or if there is a better normal, what would that look like? So we've looked at different topics, work, friendship, uh, leisure vacation, marriage, parenting. Today, we're actually looking at a topic that's had a little bit of controversy and division this past year, corporate worship in the church. Some churches have been, went significantly online for their worship services, and they went longer than other churches, all online. And man, they have been attacked by other churches um, this past year. I don't know if you know that. Um, basically, they've been called um, fearful and sellouts to the world. Meanwhile, other churches have gone the other extreme and said, we don't care about masks ever, so just come and worship. And um, they had a constitutional right to do that. Um, and that's what they did. So it's been kind of interesting as our, as our church, we've tried to navigate this sort of in a, a maybe a middle ground. Um, obviously, we're all online at one point. Now we're together and various changes as it goes. Um, as we think about, though, corporate worship together for here um, this morning, it's going to be awesome to look at, okay, let's just back out from like circumstances and just look at what does God's word say about this? And let's seek to be learners from our King and our God. So would you bow your heads? Let's pray together. So God, we come into your presence right now, and boy, do we ever need to hear from you. We need your truth. We need your leading. We need your correction. And we are so hopeful that you will meet us. We just want to acknowledge that you are our everything. And we want to give you our yes right now to whatever you will say to us through your word today. So here's our yes. It's only deserving to the great and glorious God. We pray in your name. Amen. So this past year has been a tough year on all of us. Individually, you've had challenges in your life. And then corporately, really, as you think about a state, as a nation, even as a globe, this has been a really, really tough year. And if you could think of it this way, we've all been inserted into a mess together. And so the question then, usually when you're in a mess together, is, well, how do we get out of this mess? Like, how, what's the way forward? Is there a solution? How do we make it right? Where do we turn? Now, a lot of Christians ha would have an answer to that, and I, I think it's not quite the right answer. See, when we're in a, a situation where we realize this is not optimal, this is not ideal, there's a better way, the, the response is not to bring your petitionary prayers about that specific topic. Oh God, change this and rearrange this and stop that from happening for sure, but do this. The Scriptures tell us to bring our petitions to God, but that's not what realigns our hearts. So what the Scriptures actually tell us to do is to turn to God in corporate worship together. When we're, whenever we're facing things that are larger than ourselves, problems we cannot fix, messes that need to be addressed. And when we bring ourselves to corporate worship, something miraculous happens. If we do it the way God describes, God will meet us and God will change us. And then he will show a way 
to make things better. So that's what we're going to look at today. Um, we're going to, our, our main text is going to be Psalm 95. Um, you can get out your Bibles and look at it. Uh, look on an electronic device or your paper Bibles. I'll read the entire psalm to begin. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry ground. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers, that means their forefathers, put me, put God to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. So this is the word of the Lord. And now I want to come at this with three questions. What is worship? Is there a competition for our worship? And then how do we worship God? First question, what is worship? Um, I did a lot of research and research came or looked at the scriptures, looked at a lot of like um, what people have written on it. It's interesting in the scriptures, it mostly describes how people worship. It doesn't really give you like a definition. So you kind of have to think about it and come at it from a slightly different angle. So one definition that I thought was particularly insightful was from Pastor Tim Keller. He says, here's what worship is. It's an act of ascribing ultimate value to something in a way that energizes and engages your whole being. So Psalm 95 is describing that. It's like an all that is within you experience of worship. So let me show you those. Um, first off, it describes how we sing. And we sing what's in our hearts. So verse 1, let us sing, let us make a joyful noise. Verse 2, let us make a joyful noise. Next, it expands the physicality of our mouth to our entire body because in verse 6 it says, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before. And then in verse 8, it says, do not harden your hearts. So that's the negative way of saying, keep your heart soft. So worship engages everything about who we are. It's how we ascribe ultimate value to the object of our focus. Now, worship is not then a casual interest in something. Worship is not distracted engagement like you might be distracted when you're with somebody yet like texting and doing things on your phone. Worship is not a shallow awareness like a person who might know a little bit about cooking. Worship is an enthusiast, like the experienced cook who's fascinated with the combinations of all the flavors, right? Worship is giving everything of yourself to something else. Worship involves more detailed head knowledge and heart experience than just the average person. Now, people can focus their worship on lots of different sources. In Psalm 95, the focus is God. And the worship that's described in Psalm 95, it kind of builds in momentum as it describes in attributes and sort of qualities of God. In verse 3, it says, the Lord is a great God and a great king. So he's describing just general qualities of who God is. Verse 4, he's describing how he literally holds everything he created. And then in verse 7... He says, for he is our God and we are his people, or the, we're the people of his pasture and the sheep 
of his hand. So although he's transcendent and mighty, he also gives loving, individual, thoughtful care to us as he takes care of us. So there's like a building of momentum and excitement in these descriptions of worshiping God. Psalm 95 is doing what any enthusiast does, examining God's attributes and then looking at what God does. And literally the author is just amazed by who God is. Of course we're going to sing to the Lord. Of course we're going to worship by bowing and kneeling the Lord our maker. Let's keep our hearts soft. This is worship. Question two, is there a competition for our worship? Absolutely, there's a competition for our worship. I mean, throughout Scripture, God warns us against the lure of what I'm going to call little g gods. In verse 3, it says, For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all little g gods. That's not, that's not written in there because there are legitimate supernatural false deities and gods it's i mean we see that type of thing in maybe like movies and and such but what god's doing here is he's instructing us about how our hearts work he's saying i have designed your heart to worship something and your heart will naturally seek to get energized by something when you give it all of yourself and worshiping something other than God has always been the first step that gets people in great great trouble that's why both the first and the second commandment are about worship you know the the first commandment of the top 10 you shall have no other gods before me second one in case you missed it you shall not make for yourself any idols and see, we, when we treat something else as a little God, we're, we're saying, I'm going to give you ultimate value. And people can do this with anything, really. I mean, you could do your career, money, your spouse, sex, kids. Like, I'm going to give you everything I have. This, you, it, you have ultimate value to me. I've talked at various times over the, the years about the deeper idols and gods of our hearts, right? Comfort, control, power, and approval, right? When we're seeking comfort, we say, oh, I must be loved. You, you have ultimate value. I will serve you, right? If it's control, you say, well, I must control the chaos that's surrounding me. If it's power, you say, I must be respected. If it's approval, I must be liked. I must be accepted. With all of them, the attitude is the same. If I could just have that, I'll give my everything to that. If I could just have it, then I will be okay. I'll be happy. I'll have meaning and my heart will have everything that I long for. And it's a deception. It doesn't work. The little G gods will steal life from us and destroy us. There is a great competition for our worship. And God is literally just putting himself out there in his word, through his actions, through creation, through Jesus Christ coming to earth and showing us who he is and saying, I deserve all of your worship. Stop looking at the false little G gods. That's the second question. Now, here's the third. We're going to spend most of our time on this. That, okay, if we should worship God, how do we do it? Does God have an opinion about how we worship him? Or can we just worship him any way we want? This is, by the way, the answer to this is going to be our better worship. I'm going to show you three things that are right from this passage. And the first way that God tells us how to worship is in community with one another. All of the worship that is described in Psalm 95 is plural. Let, verse 1, let us sing. 
Let us make a joyful noise. Verse 2, let us come into his presence. Let us make a joyful noise. Verse 6, same thing. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before. Verse 7, for he is our God. We are the people of his pastors. Look, God created us to worship him with other believers. And should we worship him individually? You can answer. It's okay. Yes, you should worship him individually. Every day. Every moment of your day, in fact. And we should worship him in community with other believers. To neglect that is a violation of God's design for worshiping him. Worshiping, let's talk a little bit about worshiping online. Worshiping online is a great option. And we've all done it this past year. But online worship should not become your normal weekly habit. God has a better worship for you. And it's with other people. So there's a lot of examples about corporate worship together in the scriptures. I'm going to go through them just in case you're thinking, I'm not sure I believe what Sean's saying. So (laughs) the first one, Acts chapter 13. The early church is having a worship service and look at how important it was for them to be together. Acts 13, starting with verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So the Holy Spirit called Barnabas and Saul, who becomes Paul, to go to the Gentiles as missionaries while a church worship service was happening together. The church prayed for and commissioned these guys while the church was worshiping together. When you skip worship services because you're doing something, or when you worship online, you're going to miss out on what happens in the room. Psalm 22, verse 3, talking about God, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of of Israel. This means God is especially present when his people gather together for worship. It's different. In the New Testament, Jesus communicated the same idea in a little bit of a different way when he said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. In Psalm 27, verse 4, David wrote about corporate worship, and here's what he said. He said, one thing I asked of the Lord that I will seek after. So he's saying, look, here's the one thing I want more than anything else in my entire life. Like, I'm not sure how you would answer that or what your answer would be to that. Here's my one request, God. David's one request was that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David's saying, man, there's no better place than to be in corporate worship with God's people. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says that we learn about loving people who are different from us when we take communion together in corporate worship. Matthew 5 says that we should make things right with our brother and sister in Christ before we give our offerings in a worship service. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 instructs us, let us consider how to stir one another up toward love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Here's the last one. We'll go to the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 7. Um, There's this huge, huge crowd of people from like every nation and all the languages represented. And they are gathered together in a corporate worship service 
worshiping Jesus. So the model of, of all of it is that God's best design for worshiping Him is to do it with other believers. I've, I've experienced tremendous encouragement and blessing by worshiping with other believers. I was thinking about one example I could share with you quickly. Um, on my last trip overseas, I met a young man from the country of Iraq. And as we were getting, I knew he was a Christian. He knew I was a Christian. And it was so fascinating to talk because I've heard of some things on the news related to Iraq, but I don't know that much about it. And so just to hear his story and what it's like to be a Christian there. So he had been physically persecuted for his faith. I've never experienced that. And we were very different economically, educationally, politically. Yet as we talked, there was this quick uniting of our hearts around the truth that Jesus was our Savior and that we were brothers in Christ and Jesus was our shepherd. And so later that day, we were in a worship service and I looked over and I saw his eyes were closed, his hands were lifted as he was singing, and I felt like united to him as my brother in Christ. I I even felt inspired to worship, right? We were side by side, admitting that we're, we're in failure and we're sinning and we're repenting, but yet we are focusing our hearts and our voices in song together. Like that type of action and like relationship with people ought to happen to you during corporate worship. You hear other people singing, and it spurs you on to sing. You, you see somebody else asking for prayer, and you're encouraged to pray about your burdens with maybe increased faith. You see somebody else taking notes during the sermon, and you think, maybe I should write something down so I can think about it later. You see somebody else giving their offerings. That we have a very, I think, unhealthy practice in the church in America with giving offerings. And I'll just give you a quick editorial. People accuse churches of being all about money. Some might be. We are not all about money. And so we take the scriptures in the New Testament about not knowing what your brother or sister gives to almost be blinded to the fact, well, I don't know who else is giving around here. Like, I guess nobody does. How do even the bills get paid? I know some of you have asked that to yourself. Look, we should see one another giving, not knowing how much is on that check or how much is in that envelope, and it should encourage us to give as well. Like, we're all in this together. We're the body of Christ. We're not isolated in this. One person does not pay for everything around here. Maybe you even see somebody praying, and boy, you can just tell they have a burdened heart by their posture. And maybe you like even sense the Holy Spirit prompting you to pray You're like, oh, I need to pray a little bit differently. See, this is just one of the ways that humans are meant to function together. We rub off on each other. Let me give you a, like a non-spiritual example here real, uh, real quickly. You know, why is it more exciting to go to a baseball game at the stadium than to watch it on TV? Maybe because baseball is a little slow. <laughs> and watching it on TV is like, huh, what else am I doing? That's partly true, probably. But look, it's more exciting at the stadium because you're with other people. The enthusiasm of the fan who knows everything about both teams, it rubs off on you a little bit. And the crazy mascot, he loosens you up a little bit. And by the seventh inning, you don't even know why, but you're standing and you're singing, take me out to the ball game. <laughs> and if you would analyze it, you would think, I don't, I don't, I don't even sing in public. <laughs> what happened to me? Well, you were with other people and they affected you. Christians, our worship of God is meant to be with other believers so that we can rub off on each other, not worshiping Him in isolation. 
COVID has brought more organizational and institutional isolation upon us than any other condition in modern society. Yes, homes that are large with air conditioning and central heat isolate us. Yes, cars that are really nice with amazing roads to get all around, they isolate us. Wealth isolates us as well. Look, you can research all those. It's a fascinating deep dive. But look, that's not the main point. The main point is that COVID had, took our isolation to a whole nother level. And please hear what I'm explaining to you from God's word because it's so critical for you. It's critical for the people in your family. God designed your better worship to be with other believers. If you are worshiping at home most of the time, it's time to return to corporate worship. If you have gotten used to skipping corporate worship services because we do such an amazing job recording them and you can just watch it online later, no big deal, it's time to return to corporate worship with more regularity. Your hearts need it. And God instructs us to do it. This is the first way God instructs us how to worship Him. Here's the second. Um, make Him the focus. So God is the center of attention as people gather around him together to worship. I mean, this is described in the psalm, right? They sing to the Lord, make a joyful noise to him. They're coming into his presence um, and they're worshiping and bowing down before him. You see how God's the focus of the whole thing, right? It, this is the ideal. And it should convict us when we move God out of the focus and we put ourselves in the focus. So the, the choice is really, okay, is it going to be God-focused or is it going to be you-focused? Let's just try to imagine Psalm 95. When a person says, a person reacting to Psalm 95 in a few ways. So one of the phrases that's in the, the, the psalm says, Oh, sing to the Lord. And a person reacts to that in there. They say, well... Like, for how long are we going to sing to the Lord? Um, I actually just came for the, the sermon today. Another phrase from the psalm, make a joyful noise. And the person would react, yeah, not today. I, you know, in fact, the worship leader is not p singing my favorite songs. I do not feel like making a joyful noise. Another phrase right from the psalm, come into his presence with thanksgiving. And a person's reaction is, yeah, I don't know about that. You know, it's been a really bad week for me. And I'm just not feeling that. I don't like that at all. One more. Let us worship and bow down and kneel before. And a person's reaction is, there's just no way. I mean, I, I would be so like self-conscious with such a, a physical gesture like that. There's no way I'm going to kneel down before the Lord. Now, responses like that sound a little ridiculous, don't they? I mean, we, we all see how comments like that reveal a you focus instead of a God focus. God focused worship is what God wants from all of his children, the sheep of his pastor. God expects to set the agenda of what we do when we gather together as one body. And we see that kind of example all throughout 
wor- uh, the scriptures. It's really the worship ideal in scripture. Some of my favorite passages are where God is the focus. Here's a few. I'm not going to look at them, but I'll just tell you. You can look at them later if you want. Isaiah chapter 6, Revelation chapter 4, and most of the Psalms are all God-focused um, in very, very clear, specific ways. I want to read you one of them, which is because it's just so unusual and fascinating. It's in Nehemiah chapter 8. And it's such a God-focused worship service that breaks out. Look at what, like, as I note how it's God-focused as I read. I'm going to start with verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. So they're outside. Note that first. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Israel the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand. So that's anybody who's old enough and mature enough to understand like hearing a story read. So we got a bunch of kids there. And they're on the first day of the seventh month, verse 3. And he read from it, from the book of the law, facing the square before the water gate from, note how long this happens, from early morning until midday. Hours and hours. In the presence of, in case you missed it, men, women, and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Just skip down to verse 5. And the people stood. Verse 6. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. What a curious and unusual worship service that is, huh? I mean, there's no singing, there's no shouting, there's no rejoicing. They're just reading the book of the law for hours and hours and hours. And the people are not lounging in comfy chairs. They're standing as they listen. And when it's all done, they're just so struck by the holiness and the wonder of God that they fall on their faces. Not your normal worship service. Not even the norm of what God describes as a worship service in the Bible. But on that day, that was exactly what God called for for his worship service that day. And people's hearts were aligned to this God-focused approach. And the Holy Spirit moved among them, and there was unity as they worshiped God together. So as Dan, our new worship pastor, and I and Lucas, as we plan our worship services together for our church, we're seeking to put together God-focused worship services every single week. That's very, very important to us. We pray about it. We look at the lyrics of the songs. Um, I talk about the passage of Scripture that I'm going to preach. People give me input on the the sermon and what I'm going to talk about. Because we we are very, very committed to making our worship services God-focused. Now, let me give you just a really practical tip here. Because some of you... I know at times some of you have, will say in your heart or you'll even share it with somebody else, you know, I don't know about that, Sean. I, the way he's preaching is, I don't know if I like it. I'm not sure it's my style. Man, I'm trying to be as God-focused as I can be in these sermons. And we know people say, I don't know about those songs I don't know those songs. I'm not sure I like those songs. Look, we're trying to do our best to be God-focused. So here's, let me just give you a tip. If you spend your entire week just living it up with 80s Rich Mullins songs, <laughs> worshiping Jesus, and then every once in a while for variety, you throw in a little bit of Keith Green, and then you come to church on Sunday morning, And you're like, hey, how come they're not singing some Rich Mullins and Keith Green, man? Like, that is my jam. I love that stuff. (laughs) 
you're going to be frustrated in worship because you don't know the songs we're singing. So as a really practical tip, you should be listening through the week to the songs we sing. Whatever streaming device you use, service you use, you should listen to Phil Wickham. Elevation Church, Vertical Church, Hillsong, Maverick City, Passion. So that when you're together with God's people, we can be God-focused together as we lift our voices and our hearts to God. See, a Christian who is a God-focused worshiper is like a, a trained sailor. I love this analogy. Because a sailor can, has no control over the wind blowing or not, but a trained sailor will set everything up so that when the wind blows, the boat will move. And as followers of Jesus, that's what we seek to do. Put ourselves in the right place. Make sure that we're worshiping together. Make sure that God is the focus of it all. And then when the Holy Spirit blows in, we know how to react to him. See, he sets the agenda. He leads us and he blows in the unpredictable ways, just like the wind. He'll bring the conviction, the encouragement, the leading, the rebuking, the vision. And it all comes from a humble heart, which is what we want to talk about last. What's the third description of worship in this passage? It's a soft heart. It's directly from verse 8, where it says, do not harden your hearts. And then in verses 8 through 11, God is describing a, a situation from the past where their forefathers, although they had seen God do miraculous acts for them, miracle after miracle after miracle, the Israelites found themselves in the desert. They're wandering in the desert and they didn't have enough, they didn't feel like they had enough water. So they're literally um, quarreling with Moses, their leader, saying, you're a horrible leader. Why did you lead us out here to die? Why didn't you just leave us back in uh, in Egypt as a slave, and they're testing God with their hardness of heart as they complain and as they quarrel. And now God's using that as an object lesson of what not to do when we gather together to worship God. In verse 7, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. This is why confession and repentance is such a vital part of worship. You see in the Psalms over and over and over again, where whether it's David or somebody else writing the Psalm, they will, um, they'll say various things, and then it will almost always come back to some form of confession. Because repentance and confession is like pushing the reset button on our heart, and we need that. It realigns us in a proper way to worship him. I mean, fundamentally, worship comes down to having a soft heart. We say to God, look, you have your way with me, whatever you want. I'll be together with people. I'll focus on you. And I'll bring my humble, soft heart and you set the agenda, whatever it is, God. So a few questions you can ask yourself as we're wrapping up here. Are you making corporate worship a priority? in your weeks, and in your months? Are you coming to worship with a God-focused attitude? Or a you-focused attitude? Are you coming with a prepared heart? Maybe arriving on time. Or maybe even a couple minutes early. Helps you prepare a little bit. Are you coming ready to be affected by others that are worshiping around you and ready to encourage others also? This is the better worship that God has for all of us. And when we will worship the way God tells us to, God will do something amazing while we worship him. He will meet with us. 
Would you bow your heads and let's pray together? So God, you know, at its basic, most simple level, what we really want is just to meet with you. We want to be humble. We want to show our gratitude. Lord, it's not about rules, what's right, what's wrong. I want to make sure I like dot all the dots. We, we, we need your presence. And so we ask you, examine our hearts. Reveal to us in ways that we are making this too much about us and not enough about you. Because we're so grateful for what you have done for us. You've brought us salvation through Jesus Christ. You've given us new life through the Holy Spirit who's living inside of us. And it is such an honor for us to give you our praise, to give you our worship with our mouths, to lift our hands in adoration, to bow before you with a heart that is soft. And we ask you, Lord, to move in our midst. You are our God. And we are the people of your pasture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a king seated among us. Let every heart receive him now. Where there is praise, he will inhabit. There will be grace and mercy all around. And every bird will be lifted in his presence. Every trophy will be laid down at his feet. There is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all. Unto the land, honor and glory. Worthy is he who overcame, buried in shame, risen in power. He is alive, and the stone is thrown. All our worship will belong to Him forever. Death is gone, and our Savior holds the keys. There is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above. He'll wipe away 
And we'll be at home The war will be over Soon you and me I say face to face Where every burden Will be lifted in His presence And every trophy Will be laid down People cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with your glory. We've seen you and we are overwhelmed by your beauty, your transcendence, by your glory. And we are undone in your presence. Our limitations, our weaknesses, our failures and our sins exposed. And we have nothing. We have nothing to say and nothing to give. And so we kneel before you, the only true high king. We come before you, the God who is slow to anger and rich, abundant in faithful love, whose mercies are new every morning. And we plead that you would show us mercy and grace and love again. So together, Foothills, let's pray these words. Taken from Psalm 51, with one voice, let's confess. Cry out to our God together. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions. Wash away all our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions and our sin is always before us. Against you and you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So cleanse us with hyssop and we will be clean. Wash us and we will be whiter than snow. Hide your face from our sins and blot out all our iniquity. Create in us a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Let's say that last line one more time. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, in view of his mercy, let's offer our lives as living sacrifices and worship him. Lift your eyes, lift your heads, lift your voices. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone 
none more worthy of our praise. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Then on the earth at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Sing it out. Oh, tremble. darkness into the glorious life and light of his son who will not abandon us who will not leave us alone who is with us right now and will take us into glory this God is our God and he alone is worthy of our praise so we're going to lift our voices with everything that we've got, with everything that he's given us, let's pour it out
God focused worship. It's so good. Uh, I have just been like blessed worshiping with you today. And um, I hope that today is, um, it, it is for all of us a reminder of how important it is to worship together and to make God our focus and to come with humble hearts. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about what the Lord. Uh, just did with us today. I mean, the first service was amazing as well. And my hope is that this will be a new, kind of a new trajectory for us together. It's a fascinating thing. If you go all the way back to what I was saying at the beginning of the sermon, you know, we look around like, oh, what, what about this problem? And what about this? And how do we solve that? And isn't it fascinating how God, when we just go to him, he reorients everything. He's like, remember, it's all about me. And if you will follow me, I'll show you what to do. I hope you're encouraged and blessed by that today. As you're leaving our worship service here today, you can give your offerings and your tithes as you're exiting. And remember, that's a great inspiration to other people. And part of us being together as God's people is also the conversation that happens between us naturally and organically in the lobby, in this room, in the coffee shop. I have heard people say things like, well... Maybe, maybe I can just watch online all the time because I don't really talk to anybody when I'm there anyway. Like there's no connectivity of relationship. And I would just lovingly say that that's on you. There's a lot of people here who are willing as your brothers and sisters in Christ to talk with you, to know about your life, and to, to build that horizontal community as the sheep of God's pastor. So it doesn't end just because we're leaving this auditorium. It keeps going for a while here. So let's just receive the Lord's benediction as we're ending today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may you know his countenance is upon you. And may his peace be with you. Because you are his child. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys have a great Sunday.